welcome everyone. We uh, know that the group of six classes was a little congested as we kind of came in, but I thank you all for your patience in coming out this evening. My name is Chris Terry. I'm a co-founder of SEMA. That's the Southeast Michigan Entrepreneurs Association. I'm also a candidate here in Southfield for Southfield City Council. So again, I want to welcome you all to this forum. We put this forum on to enlighten the community as a whole, not just Southfield and Detroit, but for Southeast Michigan as a whole. There's some issues that we want to deal with, some issues that we want to confront in terms of our bridge between the suburban and the city. Because certain issues that we need to cover, just to kind of get a dialogue going, and also try to come up with certain solutions that we need to do. As we know, we're dealing with high unemployment in our community, we're dealing with uh, foreclosed homes, we're dealing with a just an infrastructure that we're trying to rebuild in this community. And I know that as far as my own platform, dealing with an economic plan for job creation, that's going to be vital. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you all together. And this is one of the first and of many of forms that we will, you know, attend here in the city. So uh, first of all, we're going to get the thing moving. I'm not going to bore you too much this evening. Uh, but first of all, I want to, you know, bring up our first uh, speaker. Our first speaker that we're going to bring up is Dr. Zelania Allen. Uh, Dr. Zelania Allen is the founder of SEMA, the Southeast Michigan Entrepreneurs Association. Uh, she's also a professor at uh, Phoenix uh, University. Uh, she's also an accomplished public speaker, where she has spoken all over the country, and she's a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, let's give her a round of applause for Mrs. Dr. Zelania Allen. Waiting for Superman that talked about 
the problems with the education system nationwide. How many of you saw that movie? Okay. When Barack Obama ran for office a couple years ago, there was a quote that he kept saying that really resonated with me. And he said, we are the change that we've been waiting for. Superman is not coming. We have to be the change that we want to see. So for us, tonight is a call to action. <coughs> if we're going to resolve the economic problems in our community, in our state, in our country, I think the first thing we have to do is be honest. Be honest about what the problem is, who caused the problem, and how we're going to fix it. Now, when you go to the doctor, the first thing they do is ask you a series of questions. You say, I'm sick, and they ask you a series of questions, and then they run a lot of tests and come up with a diagnosis. And then they prescribe a solution. And that is what we need to do in terms of our economic problem. We need to diagnose the problem, find out what caused it, who caused it, before we can come up with a viable solution. I just said we need to be real honest. So I'm going to be honest and say that I believe the reason that we are in this situation today is because of greed and corruption. Greed and corruption that could have been prevented. Greed by the top corporate executives in this country, particularly in the financial services industry, and our government, who have allowed more and more deregulation and allowed these companies to go on the back. I believe consumers have some responsibility as well, but the larger problem lies with our top corporate executives <coughs> and government officials who have not held these people accountable. The American dream is something that we all aspire to. We dream of growing up, getting a good job, buying a car, and a home. But there are those who decide to exploit the American dream. If you look into the auto industry, there's lots of issues there. Uh, I can personally say I've never purchased a car where I haven't been cheated some kind of way. Uh, the last time I purchased a car, they sold me some auto insurance that I knew nothing about. And then, Someone came up with the bright idea of shipping good-paying American jobs overseas for cheaper labor without any real thought to it. And I think this has had a domino effect. I don't have time to go into more detail, so I'm going to do this briefly. Uh, next, I want to look at the mortgage industry. Financial services companies began ranking their customers over the cold, first with the credit cards, the high interest rates, uh, the ridiculous fees, and then came the subprime loan. Now, the lenders, this is really what boggles my mind, these lenders deliberately sold people homes that they knew they could not afford. And they did not care whether or not these people could pay these loans back because they bundled them up in something called CDOs, with some other loans, uh, student loans, auto loans, and they sold them <coughs> off to investment banks for people to invest in. So they got their money. So they didn't care if those loans could be repaid. Once people began defaulting on those loans, the system collapsed. But the top executives already had their money. And none of these people have been prosecuted. The CEO of Countrywide reportedly made over $400 million while middle class families were set in the street. This is outrageous and people should be outraged, but I don't see that outrage. So from my perspective, that is the problem. Solution. Number one, I think we need more government regulation. There was a time when the government would regulate these industries and would not allow them to take risks with consumers' money. They did not do their job. In fact, they worked to deregulate the financial services industry even further. 
and the same executives who run the financial institutions and prey on customers from companies like Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Merle Lynch, they end up working for the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and the Obama administration. And the question that I have is how are the same people who created this problem going to resolve it? Einstein once said, no problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created it. We need new people with new ideas and integrity. Number two, self-regulation. We the people have to take control of our own life. If someone is trying to sell you a house for a half a million dollars and you know you only make $30,000 a year, red flags should go up. Number three, entrepreneurship. This country was built on the back of small business. Small businesses in Michigan employ most of the residents here. So I believe this is the way that we can bring back the economy. At the Southeast Michigan Entrepreneurs Association, we have organized, we're putting together programs and workshops that will teach people how to start and grow your own business. Currently, we're working with Kathy McClellan, former CEO of the Detroit Entrepreneurship Institute to develop this nine-month series that will help teach people how to start and grow your business the right way. We have to start owning things. Number four, multiple strengths of income. Research shows that all successful people have multiple strengths of income. They, even if you have a nine-to-five job, you can still start a business on the side, even if it's just network marketing. Research also shows that most successful people belong to some type of organization, which leads me to number five. Join an organization of like-minded people. Of course, I would recommend that you join our association. Uh, we're very active. In March, we had the Entrepreneurs Forum, which brought out over 100 entrepreneurs. Uh, we did the Ultimate Mixer in June, which was a speed networking event, very successful. We've done workshops in internet marketing and social media. And we had an annual picnic this summer. Our monthly meetings are the fourth Thursday of each month. Our next meeting will be uh, September 22nd, right here at the Southfield Library. And our speaker will be Donald E. Snyder, Senior Vice President of Urban Economic Development for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. We've also formed partnerships with the Southfield Chamber of Commerce and LBN, which is local business network of business owners who have chapters all over Michigan because we know the value of partnering and working together. Number six, let your voice be heard. We have to get involved in the political process. Politicians help to create the laws, and whether you vote or not, you are going to be affected by these laws. So you might as well be a part of the process. And finally, number seven, educate yourself both formally and informally. This is how we can begin to contribute to the collective consciousness of the universe. If each of us is doing something to improve ourselves and our consciousness, that's automatically going to uplift this community. Napoleon Hill once said, whatever the, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, either way you're right. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That is the word of God. We've been getting the message over and over and over again that our thinking is what controls or determines our life. So we have to start changing the way that we think. We have to focus on what we want instead of focusing on what we don't want and focusing on the past. One of the things that I think has kept this region or held this region back is our focus on our former mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick. Uh, he's been all over the news this week. Um, the news media chases him down, follows him to Texas, spies on him, and I think this is ridiculous. We cannot move forward 
if we are focusing on the past. So we have to improve our level of thinking, focus on our future, and move this region forward. In conclusion, I believe that greed and corruption created the economic crisis. We the people must come together and speak out against it. We must control our destiny by developing an entrepreneurial spirit and owning our own businesses. We must read, become educated, and focus our thinking on where we're going and not where we've been. And I want to leave you with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Ladies and gentlemen, these are challenging times that we face. Where do you stand? Let your, vo let your voice be heard. And remember to vote on November 8th. Thank you.
seven African-American-owned businesses who believe in the same pursuits that Chris Terry believes in, put together their first chamber of commerce and elected an unbelievable leader in Patrick A. Miles to uh, lead that mission, who was a roommate with President Obama at Harvard Law School. Uh, so when you talk about the poss possibility and the leadership around the table, I'm not surprised what's here in the city of Southfield. Um, two weeks ago, we launched the Lansing Black Chamber of Commerce in the heart of our capital, uh, in which we elected uh, Dr. Marcy Street, MD, who owns several dermatology centers across the entire city. Um, and I tell you folks, uh, whenever you say excitement, uh, this opportunity to link an economic industry uh, a community that has not yet connected the dots is where we need to go. Uh, there's over 79,000 black-owned firms in the state of Michigan. Most people don't know that. Uh, we spend close to $8.9 billion as a consumer purchasing power base as African Americans. In the city of Detroit alone, there's over 40,000 African American businesses, which ranks number four in the entire country. Okay? But let me say even surprising statistics. Let me say something that is true to its own, and I'm not surprised when you hear from Dr. Allen, because African-American women, there are more African-American-owned uh, women businesses in southeastern Michigan than anywhere in the country, okay? So African-American women have bought it, uh, African-American women own it, and African-American women are out here doing it in an entrepreneurial way. So I want to highlight those facts. about results, about producing numbers. Uh, I don't want to 
hear what you're talking about. Show me the numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so judge people by what they produce. That's what this is about. So it's serious times. I'm an elected official in the city of Detroit, and we have just revised the entire constitution for the city of Detroit. The governor just approved it. serious fundamental government changes, but the one thing that you'll see in that charter is that there is now an allowance towards economic pursuits in policy, and that's where we have to focus. The policy now will dictate the opportunity for international trade, import and export incentives and benefits for businesses of minorities. There will be other plans in the charter to focus on economic and community and social entrepreneurship empowerment within a district system. I think districts will perpetuate an opportunity for us to co colloquially and community-wise focus on areas and build industry. That's what we have to do. And find where the businesses are. You might have eight, nine barbershops on one block. Why do we need eight, nine barbershops and beauty su uh, supply on one shop? Find a unique business, there's so many of them, and let's carve out an economic agenda. Let's get a block together by the block <laughs> and put in place the things we need in the community so I don't have to go 20 miles to purchase those goods and services. So I want to talk to you guys. I'm going to shorten this conversation real quick. You have a dynamic panel, dynamic speakers. I'm here to answer questions, and I hope I can be one of pursuit for you to reach your economic and entrepreneurial dream. Thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me. It's an honor. Dr. Allen, I look forward to answering questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, one, one more time, let's give it up for Mr. Kent here. Yeah. You know, um, in terms of what he's speaking, that it's time, you know, we have to move with a sense of urgency. Um, you know, I think the thought behind that is our sense of urgency has almost passed us by. We have to move with the utmost of urgency. Um, there's a situation when you mentioned as far as the uh, barbershops and things of that nature. You know that 80% uh, I would say, you know, business ownerships within our region are hair salons. If it wasn't for hair salons, we would have probably about less than 10% of African American business ownerships in this region. If it wasn't for hair salons, we got to do better than that. You know, we have to do, we have to do better. You know, uh, looking at what's going on around us, you know. We can look at the center point in our community as far as ownership because the thing is, is that you know that same old quote, well, you know, they get the tax break. That's why. We getting this, we getting that. But the thing is, is that your opportunity is going to have to come with each other, supporting each other. And that's something that we don't do because we'll boycott each other in a minute. In a minute, we try to open up something. See, see if you get boycotted or not. That, that's what's going to happen. So we have to understand the demographics as far as what we have to do to build <coughs> because we have to tear it down before we build it back up. Mm -hmm. If you go down, I was down in Midtown the other day looking at, you know, Whole Foods coming, a lot of things are prospering within the medical center, within the university district. And the thing is that when I look at the region in Southfield, I'm like, you know, we're moving at a snail's pace. This is like Mayberry, okay, in terms of innovation, in terms of what we're looking towards. So I had to go outside of this region to bring in speakers from other parts of the region mm -hmm. so we can come together as one. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. And that, that's the power in numbers. Because I can't do it by myself and stop looking at either one else. So we got to do better. So our next speaker. <laughs> and as I'm uh, uh, pulling out the, the bios, the next speaker, uh, she, she makes me feel kind of old uh, mm -hmm. because this next speaker. She rose through the ranks real quick. I think she went from kindergarten all the way to land. <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, she, she's just phenomenal. Uh, I'm gonna admire her. Um, she's our. Uh, she's a state representative um, in the state of Michigan. Uh, she's an individual who she's a graduate of Bradford High School, and she goes back to her community. And one thing about Chanel Jackson, she does what she says she's going to do. She's speaking up for the youth, for the young adult. She is the future of this state. Yes. And uh, we are very honored to have her here. Um, Chanel Jackson, uh, she is, um, adult, uh, she is um, you know, native Detroiter. She is dedicated to serving her community and improving the job climate in, in our community. 
And I'm not going to go on because I want her to speak on some things that she wants to speak on and kind of enlighten you all as far as what she brings to the table. So let's give it up for our state representative, Ms. Janelle Jackson.
school are 30 and 40 years old and never had a job. I counsel young women who have never written really anything down. Many of them don't have their GED. Um, and so when we have this dialogue about bridging an economic gap uh, or between Southfield, and I want to say even Oakland County, and Detroit or Wayne County, or just in general in this region, we have to be honest about really where we are. And that is that if every job in the world, <laughs> you know, if we got 30,000 jobs to hit this region tomorrow, how many of us would qualify? Mm -hmm. How many of us would be capable mm -hmm. to work those jobs? Mm -hmm. And that's really the matter. And so to me, the key, the, the main focus in bridging whatever gap exists and building alliances is to get to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is education. Uh, we have certainly seen under this administration, um, and even the previous one, to be honest, uh, and you've seen it all over the nation, declines in education funding on every level, K through 12, uh, this year in the, in the Snyder uh, budget, the House Republican and Senate budget, there were, I think, what, uh, $425 per people cut. So to every public school student in the state of Michigan, you had that cut. Uh, then you had a 22% cut to higher education. Um, you had cut to <coughs> community colleges where there did not need to be any cuts. Uh, so this, in my estimation, and there was a young woman who said it even better to, you know, earlier today, I, I hope that I can be uh, as articulate as her, but this is really an assault. <laughs> I mean, we're being attacked here. And I think the 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 focus needs to be to the degree that there is still funding in education. We need to have a waiting line for job training programs, for education programs, uh, whatever it is that people need uh, uh, to be uplifted. Uh, we certainly need to be, I mean, those, those roles need to be filled. And the bottom line is, in many communities that service people that, that are from socioeconomic backgrounds, like many of us may be from, uh, or from communities of color, those programs are not full. So it's hard to advocate in the legislature for more dollars and stop the cut and continue this program when um, they don't have enough students as it exists. And so we need to think about that. To me, that's the root of the problem. And then when we talk about, after we finish that, then I think we can have some dialogue about some of the other facets. But I do appreciate your time, and uh, I apologize that I didn't bring an eloquent speech with me. But I look forward to sharing with you, and together, um, this region, our, our state, our nation will move forward. And that's the thing I've been saying lately. i got to just add this, forward lean. Somebody, one of my mentors put that in my ear not too long ago. He's like, oh, uh, in another state, rep, rep, I'm, 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 I'm on my forward lean. And then I turn on to MSNBC and Rachel Maddow said, lean forward. I mean, that's what we, that's, that's got to be our disposition. You know, ultimately, I think what has happened here, uh, even among, I mean, look at this room, and, I, and I'm going to be 100. I, I, I guess I, I know Ken was 100. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't, and I know, you know, in, in Detroit, and I know probably many of you in this room are from Detroit or whatever. We, you know, we, many of our parents and our friends look to Southfield as the oasis. You know, Oakland County. I'm getting to Oakland County. But even in here, and I'm certainly saying this respectfully, all of these seats need to be there. Hmm. So there's an apathy in our community in general, even among the more affluent. People have just decided that it is what it is. And times are hard, and it's just not going to be any better. It will be better. We've got to check. One, we got to focus on the root of the problem. Two, we have to change our disposition and change what it is our expectation is. We need to be on our forward lean. And that's where I am. I hope to partner with you on that. I want you to be on your forward lean. And uh, together we will lean forward. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
part of the equation, you are part of the problem. Uh, after our last primary here in Southfield, we had a turnout of 9% African American voter rates in Southfield. We have individuals in Southfield, 30% of homeowners that have school-aged children and not send their kids to Southfield Public Schools. Okay. We have a situation where we have a lot of the, uh, children from Detroit that come into the school system. If it wasn't for the students coming from Detroit, they would have to shut Southfield Lake mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, everybody has uh, left to go to Birmingham and Novi and you know, all of those things. And 80% of the shoppers that come into Southfield that buy are from Detroit. Detroit is holding Southfield up because everybody lives in Southfield. Where do they go to shop? Troy. 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 And nobody. nobody. So Southfield is holding, I mean, Detroit is holding Southfield up. Uh, if you go stand at the corner of 8 Mile and Greenfield, just stand there for about 10 minutes and see what you, you know. Just think about it. Stand there for about 10 minutes. Um, Greenfield and 8 Mile. I, I said it before and I got in trouble for it. I said Southfield starts at 9 Mile. <laughs> okay. Because of where? Because of what? I'm serious. I'm serious. You go to 8 Mile and Rock. Go to 8 Mile and, go to eight mile and, and Evergreen. And stand there for five minutes. Okay. So what I'm saying to you all is this. When we talk about the bridge and economics and things of that nature, we have to be honest within ourselves as far as our economic growth and what we have to do in that short span between Greenfield, Lasser, 8 Mile, 9 Mile. We have so many people, you know, you know, having their own business, doing things like that. But I just wanted to bring that point because I want you all to think about that. But we're going to get to our next speaker here. Our next speaker, Dr. Sylvia Jordan. Ms. Jordan has been a fixture in this community. She has been a pillar in this community. Uh, she has sown a seed in a lot of individuals' lives in this community. Uh, she has been a uh, president of city council here in Southfield. She's running, currently running for Southfield City Council. She's a superior business owner. And I just want to say that she has been an influence and a mentor in my life for over six years. And I want to bring her up to a round, round of applause. And I don't want to get too detailed in her bio because I want her to speak on some things. But let's give a round of applause.
inches off the ground. He only weighed, well, he was supposed to weigh 20 pounds, but he gained a little weight. He was 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted to go out and bark at the men that were working in our yard. And I said, no, Jake, you can't go outside. He said, run, 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 run. I want to go outside. I said, no, Jake, you can't go outside. He said, run, 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 run. I said, no, Jake, you can't go outside. But this is what he did that I will never forget. After I told him no three times, he ran over to his food. He ate just two bites of his food, and he came back and he looked at me. And I said, you know what? You win. Because in our home, any time he ate food, he got a chance to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> what he did was he re-strategized and gave his mind another way to get to where he was. <laughs> and I believe that we're all at the point that we've got to re-strategize where we want to go. We can't do the same old, same old. If somebody is constantly telling us no, then we've got to think of another way. We can't just do the status quo. And that's how we've got to think in the 21st century. That's how we've got to think this day forward. That's how we've got to think owning our own business. That's how we've got to think uh, uh, restructuring our families. That's how we've got to think in order for our city to survive. We've got to think differently. And when I think about here, you know, in Southfield, we have a regional library, which mm -hmm. many communities draw from. Not only Detroit, but Farmington Hills and other uh, cities. We've got to think as a city, how can we benefit financially from others that are tapping into our resources? If not, this library will stay on the backs of the residents. Now let's talk about Detroit. In my opinion, there's a beautiful jewel, Bill Isle. Why is everybody enjoying the benefits of Bill Isle and the city is not tapping? Not tapping. There should be, this is my opinion, I'm in Southfield, there should be a gate, right, at that bell out. You should have to pay. <laughs> no resources for you to go back. Because Lansing isn't concerned about us. That's right. We've got to make our own resources. We've got to let our own city survive. We can't depend on the money being funneled down as it's supposed to be. I believe we have to think differently. We've got to... Uh, Get vision, where you have to have a vision for your life personally. Everybody needs to own their own business. Mm -hmm. I agree with uh, Dr. Ken Harris. I agree with uh, uh, my other colleague that spoke, Dr. Um, Galania. We have to have your, you got to have your own business. Mm -hmm. Because that we've already seen it. Well, we can't depend on the big three mm -hmm. even to carry us into retirement. And so we've got to be willing to embrace entrepreneurship. Be willing to embrace starting our own business. And I mean, you have to do it at every, do it every day to start your own business. That's what I've struggled with, even uh, making the decision to come back to city council. I love making money. I love being able to give. You know, you can make money, but then you've got to give back to those in your family and those in the community. And so we've got to be willing to not just let life pass us by, but we've got to give it a So I want to challenge you to uh, think differently. Turn to your neighbor and say, be like Jake. Be, be like, like Jake. Jake. <laughs> 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 oh, no. let's, let's think about another way that we can do it. Okay. Good job, Thank you.
about her fairness and firmness as she comes up to speak. And let's give a round of applause for Attorney Deborah Smith.
because of segregation, we had no choice but to do business with each other. There's been some comments tonight about not doing business with each other during segregation. We didn't have a choice. And we didn't have a choice as to uh, the fact that we needed to create our own business opportunities. So segregation was a crisis, but some people considered to be the capital, actually, that made the black underclass thrive in economics. Uh, but it's the same could be said for the Jewish community or the Middle Eastern community, because what tends to happen when you perceive as a culture that you've been shut out from the mainstream, you make your own opportunity. And that's what I think we need to go back to. We need to go back to making and creating our opportunity. So what should we do? There are a lot of uh, great ideas to kickstart Michigan's economy. For example, uh, Senator Debbie Savinoff has proposed that Michigan become the home of battery innovation. Uh, she wants to see Michigan develop and manufacture advanced battery technology. This is an excellent idea, and uh, elected officials, and maybe some of those in our panel tonight, uh, have proposed and support the same mission. Last Thursday evening, our president uh, spoke to the nation about the jobs plan. President Obama proposed, and I believe he was speaking especially to small businesses because he said that these initiatives would affect those businesses with less than 50 employees. He spoke about uh, cutting payroll taxes from 6.2% to 4.2%. He suggested and proposed a $4,000 tax credit for any business that had been looking for an employee for over six months. Uh, because again, he wants to get people off of the under 20 flow. He also proposed extending the tax credit for businesses that would allow them to deduct the full amount of any new equipment. All such plans would be very beneficial to struggling businesses. Uh, personally, I like uh, the President's plan to foster and encourage small businesses. Uh, the focus on small business actually goes hand in hand with what we're seeing now at a lot of the colleges and universities. Uh, there are programs now, not just a major business administration, but a major entrepreneurship. Uh, I have a, a son that goes to, I have two kids in college, one goes to a Georgia Black College in Virginia, the other goes to an Ivy League University in Rhode Island, and both of them have majors for degree programs in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very telling. Mm -hmm. uh, in our community, we have individuals who are strong advocates for entrepreneurship, they live with reason notions, that we should not wait for economic recovery, we should not wait for jobs to come knocking on the door, there was once a comedian that joked, job, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong, a job is great. However, if you give a man a fish, uh, do you give a man a fish? That's the question, do you give him a fish and call and teach him to fish for himself? So there are those who believe that it's not about just creating jobs, it's about creating business opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you create a business <coughs> opportunity, the job will follow. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, one such believer, uh, and owning your own business for over 30 years. In fact, when I was still a college student, uh, he was embarking on his first uh, ownership, or his first ownership of his first uh, fast food franchise. Uh, he and his wife had taught their children to be entrepreneurs and not employees. And he's even written a book about it called Beyond the Blame. As a matter of fact, he mentioned earlier by Dr. Allen, and has just stepped in. His name is John Schneider, and I'd like to just ask him to stand for a Thank you. 
Another local hero, he's come and gone. I had an opportunity to introduce him to members of the panel. Mike Daniels. Mike sponsors or hosts a entrepreneurial uh, networking event every quarter. There's another one coming up on September 28th at Phoenix and Cornbread because we like to do business with Patrick Coleman here in our neighborhood on Northwestern Highway. It's a wonderful event. Uh, there was a time when there were just a few people, now it's standing room only. And individuals ready to come and share ideas, hear from people like now about how to get space or how to get funding or uh, what to do with their buddy business. But it's really sparked a lot of interest in people helping themselves, but also giving information back to each other. Why well, really reinvent the wheel? If you know something that can help another entrepreneur, uh, give them that information. Uh, in closing, uh, I think we should use the current economic climate as a challenge to make it stronger and self-reliant. Let's use the help of the federal government uh, programs to promote small business. Let's use the courses that are being developed at our local colleges and universities that are giving us a blueprint as to how to start and run and operate small business. But let's also use the local entrepreneurs like uh, Chris Perry here on our panel and Russ of our panel and Donald and Michael. Let's use the people that we do have in the community who do want to use the way in terms of uh, small business opportunities. Uh, and let me remind you of one last thing. <coughs> Not all good ideas are this stuff. Uh, with every new innovation, it spawns a multitude of other ideas. Uh, let's use present day examples of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And let me remind you, it was a college sophomore who created and founded Facebook. He didn't have a college degree. He founded Facebook and left college. I'm not saying that's the way to go, but he has been offered the last estimate $15 billion for Facebook, and he still turned it down. So there are opportunities out there, there are ideas. Don't think that it's too late for you if some idea that you've had in the back of your mind can't be done or somebody else has done it, it has to happen. So, the economy is terrible in Detroit and Southfield, and when that happens, it affects the entire state of Michigan. And But it's not a problem, it's actually an opportunity. So let's take the opportunity, start a business, if it's something that you've been thinking about, there's people in this room who can help you and lead the way. Thanks.
there's just a couple of areas right now that I have put a lot of emphasis in and I want to remind people as this is the 21st century. And in the 21st century, we are going to have to remember we cannot continue to hold on to the 20th century idea. The way we did business in 19 whatever year, 1990, 1980, 1970, going back, we can't continue to work that way. Our environment is totally different, of course, I don't need to tell you that. We are more into a global society. We are no longer competing with the person that's sitting next to you or living next to you. That's right. And if we don't change our methodology and our thinking, First, we need to move from being consumers. Now, I stand guilty just like anybody else. I like to spend my husband's money. <laughs> but at some point, in time, we need to look at new ways of what to do with our money. And we are going to have to start bringing our money together collectively. We are going to have to look at what resources are out there and stop hoarding. We're going to have to become more competitive and be more open to each other. Uh, someone said earlier about looking at sharing. We're not going to get into the 21st century methodology, thought process without having collaborated. And that's a key word that we all need to really build in our, in our vocabulary and look at how we can do it. Uh, we need to also be more mindful of some of the areas in which we have not looked at before and not reached out as much before. Um, my husband and I have been fran our franchise owners. We are in the 7 Eleven uh, phasing out of it. But franchising is always a good way to get started. Joint partnering with someone. Find a uh, prime that you can work with. Uh, I built my business, Advantage Consultant, and we have time, I will talk about that. Uh, by partnering with a successful company that nurtured me as I grew in mine. I see Pat Cole back there. I hope she don't mind. There were many times when I first started out. I went to Pat. Pat was a, uh, a very successful woman, and, I, and not only a successful woman, she was a very successful business person. She was someone that I would turn to and ask for ideas. We've got to be open. We, we've got to be more open now than ever before. It's not a matter of if it's a Detroit or a South Bend. It is a region. It is a region that is a discussion. I am currently an Oakland County Commissioner. I have that discussion with my colleagues. Uh, some of them are very close-minded to it, and others are beginning to become more open-minded. But we're not going to be able to stand on our own bottom by ourselves. And we're going to have to look at ways that we do clusters, joint ventures, partnership. But somewhere in there, to this economy, to move forward, we're going to have to look at a way to do it. I strongly, I strongly recommend that we be more open to sessions like this. And someone said this room should be full, and it should. Not only this room, but any other one where they're giving out information that people are willing to share. It should be filled to the rim. Because now, more than ever before, we are going to have to change our whole thought process. We are going to have to become more open to this 21st century. And I assure you, as we move through this century and 10 years out, we're going to see real quickly that there's going to be something new. Uh, we're no longer at a point where we can uh, become a, an expert in one thing. We, uh, we have to become experts in being open and receptive. Because by the time I learn how to use my little phone here, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> and my little 14-year-old nephew looked at me and said, ugh.
don't have to know, I have you. So <laughs> unless you have that connect with someone or to some distance or something that can help grow and nurture you along, where well, you're going to be left behind. And we don't want anybody left behind because even if you are left behind, it's, it's going to become incumbent upon us to reach back and bring people along with us because we cannot succeed right. by leaving those behind. Right. And it's even more important as I was listening to something, I'm a C-SPAN fanatic, I was listening to something on C-SPAN uh, yesterday and it was showing and giving diagrams of the gap, the income gap with the uh, black community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we're getting real close to the have and the have not. Right. And that gap is, is getting bigger and bigger. So somewhere in there, we're going to not only look at ways to create wealth, <laughs> we're going to look at ways to create this wealth so we can share this wealth and bring people along. I don't necessarily mean handing out something. Mm -hmm. I mean giving wealth back so it becomes knowledge, mm -hmm. so that it can become, so that others can look at a way to create more wealth and bring people along with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you're never successful if you're not bringing someone along. I was recently listening to something on C-SPAN again, uh, <laughs> where it said, you know, how people like that I was the first this, and I was the first entrepreneur, black entrepreneur, I was the first black kind of person, you know, we, we get caught up in that. But you don't mean anything you the first that's not second. That's right. <laughs> so if there's not a second, then there's something wrong with that. There is not a success. So, I leave you with, and certainly want to get into the question and, and dialoguing with you. Know that we're in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. We're about to change some things on the CSS 21st century. Know that we're going to have to be able to bring along people with us because if you're <coughs> successful and you're the first this, you're the first that, that's wonderful. And I applaud you for being that. Mm -hmm. However, you need a second. <laughs> and so we said third. But you do need a second one to show that there is a succession. And we as and I say that as African Americans and I and just guilty, we do not plan for our succession. And we need to start doing that. All right. <laughs> Great economic news that I have a news flash that just came in about 30 seconds ago. There's a economic group. Give it away, Mike. But um, a great economic uh, plan um, is a community based ownership. When you leave out of here today on the table, there's a group called the Nose Arc Business Group. I want you all to take a card with you. I want you to study. <coughs> I want you to understand as far as with business ownership, community-based ownership, where you can take, you can have a piece of that ownership with supermarkets, with restaurants, gas stations, and the like. So when you leave this room on the table, there's a card that's going to say the Nose Arc Business Group. And I want you to look at that. I want you to study it, look at the website, and I want you to give that number a call because guess what? There is a plan. There is an economic plan that we're going to move forward with. So I just want to leave that news flash. Right. Okay. Um, our next guest, our distinguished guest we want to bring up is Senator Coleman Young. Okay, he's another gentleman that makes me feel old. You know, <laughs> and he talk and he's down let get a chance to speak with one another. Um, as you know, he served uh, as a Democratic state representative for two terms, uh, and then he was elected at, in landslide vote as our state senator. Uh, Coleman Young has been an innovator in terms of trying to get initiatives out as far as the reading programs with the youth, as far as getting initiatives to have something in plan now where the police officers in Detroit, and I want you to give it up for this, that he is putting in place for Detroit police officers to live in the city All of right. Detroit. Yeah. So without further ado, we would like to bring Senator Coleman Young.
evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, Southfield. Wow, I don't know what to say. All those great things, that great introduction. See, I can go home. That was fantastic. I just wanted to say something very quickly. I'm going to be brief. Um, in every adversity, in every trial, you can either choose to break down or to break through. Mm -hmm. And I think that us being gathered here today, we have made a decision to break through. Right. Yeah. We have made a decision that we are going to break through with jobs. We have made a decision that we're going to break through with making sure that our small businesses have access to the capital they need. Mm -hmm. We have made a decision that we're going to break through by hiring our own in Southfield and in the city of Detroit. Right. We have made a decision that we're going to make a breakthrough for those brothers and those sisters that's going to job application to job application and it's getting in the hundreds and the two hundreds and the three hundreds that they can have their opportunity to start work right here in small business. Mm -hmm. That is what you're providing. You are providing more than just jobs. You're providing hope and opportunity. You are the pillars of excellence and the foundation of greatness in which this city and which this country will be built upon. Mm. And so what I'm simply here to say to you is thank you. I want to say let's break through so we can have dynamic, dimensional change for the next generation. Mm. And when they talk about what was the turnaround for Southfield, what was the turnaround for the city of Detroit, it was that a group of people of like mind who had a just cause got together and made things happen for their people, and we have full employment in the city of Detroit and Southfield. Yeah. Thank you, and God bless you.
and any get amount of money is too much with us. We can't get along. But if we want a big screen TV, we want a car, we want a house, we'll throw that money away. Now to me, risk is, risk is, is when you wake up one day and you trust your job that you're going to have it for 30 years and you go buy a house for $200,000. Right. And that's risk. Okay? When I open up my store at 9 on Telegraph, in 04, I had $41,000. Now, I can take the $41,000, go buy a house, a truck, or something like that, or I can do something else with it. The difference between rich people and poor people is that poor people like to work for their money, and rich people put their money to work. That's right. Okay? So I got this $41,000, I've got to put it to work. So what I decided to do, I said, you know what? Let me go do this restaurant thing, John's Jumbo Bird. Man, am I going to have to work. Boy, you know, but the thing about it is, I need to turn it, I need to flip it. So I went and I, I put it in there, and I make $100,000 a year. But it takes the same amount of time to make $100,000 a year as it does to make $100 million a year. You're still working. Right. You're still putting in the time, whatever you do. And what we don't understand, those people that think they're safe, <laughs> but we're in a time where you're not going to be safe. Okay? Now it's easy for me to just, you know, hey, I'm okay. I'm planning. I understand economics 101. If the bank is not lending money, mm. if your house is worthless, mm. if the bank is not lending you money on commercial real estate that's paid for, mm. if the bank is not lending you money on a house that's paid for, mm. if, the, if the bank is shutting down credit lines of all small business, I got $180,000 in my line shut down. If I didn't pay them, I understand. That's right. Mm -hmm. But I'm paying this. My credit score is 7 8. When they tell me I'm not getting it, I want to know why. Mm -hmm. You know? That's right. There was a time when they said I wouldn't get it. I said, oh, okay. That's okay. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Because I know I'm sure. You know? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I go ahead and leave, okay? So, 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 a small business employs 85% of jobs in America. Mm -hmm. And the president's plan doesn't include them, okay, because I know all about that. You ain't going to get that money. That money he got over there, he's talking about, it's cables on, it's all kinds of landmines. You ain't going to get that money. Because the guy's a socialist. It's called what it is. He's right. a socialist. And he's leading you somewhere. Whether you believe it or not, it's unimportant. Whether you believe in God or not, it's unimportant. The facts are what they are, okay? So I'm on the front line. I make my money every 10 minutes. I can't imagine working once a week and trying to get a check. I just can't imagine. I can't understand why anybody would want to make their money once a week or once a month. I just can't imagine that. You know? So what you have here is, the answer to this equation is, is that we have to come up with a system that's like banking and insurance, where you can get paid. Now, now what's happened in the past 20 years? 401k. When they, when they, when they stole your pension, they said, okay, we're going to give you 401k. Because we're going to steal your pension. Okay? So we start off with matching funds, true enough, matching funds. Then it went from 25%, 10%, to nothing at all. So now you can't even retire. That's right. Because with the cost of living, with your guy, uh, devaluing your dollar, what's going to happen is the cost of gas and the cost of food is going to rise. Because this guy keeps printing money in the basement. This money ain't back by anything. Okay? So then, you know, local bread will be available, but it's going to cost you $10,000 a day for money to be able to buy it. Okay? So what happens is, now, you, now you, you've been screwed on your house, and you've screwed on your 401k, and then it's okay, you know what? Let's do a rock retirement fund, all right? Okay? And we're going to pay you $0.05 cents on a dollar, $0.10 on a dollar, whatever. <coughs> um, unless you got some money, okay, you know, you ain't got nothing coming. Keep in mind, these guys are gambling with your money. They're throwing the dice with them, you know? You got these white guys like, you know, Warren Buffett, you know? And then we just found out in the last, uh, you know, 10 years that it is gambling. And now they're telling you that it's gambling. So you have no retirement. Then you got a president that says, you know what? You deserve health care. He didn't say it was free. He said you deserve it. And we'll find out what's in it when he passed the bill. So we get the bill, big bill. But then we find out that you have a lifetime benefit, but you only have a $100,000 allotment per year. Damn. 
You get cancer, chemo is 50,000 a shot. You get two shots of chemo. And then the government. Yeah. Now, what's your? Is, is there a question? Because we do have. Uh, uh, no, I'm going to be done in a minute. Uh, uh, no, ain't a question. Because I own my own stuff. And what I'm saying, the answer to this equation you're talking about is we need to get together, combine our resources. There's an old saying: no Jews, no dogs on the beach. What do the Jews do? Anybody know? Bought the beach. There you go. So why don't we stop crying and buy that beach? <laughs> the beach is for sale. <laughs> Detroit is the poster child of how, how they want the United States to be. And we can cry and talk to the cows come home. Why don't we put our money up and stop talking, stop crying, and go by that beach? And no disrespect, though, yes. uh, why don't you wait for the next session and then we can put you on the panel? No, I don't want to be on the panel. I just said, well, that's okay. right here. That's but I'm saying, if we have that plan, okay. so okay. we'll start we'll business that's what it is. Right. Okay, what okay. well, we're going to do, she's got a question. If you've got a question, you know, sure. Wow. <laughs> Ooh, let me break. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here in respect of, of Terry and, and also, and also um, Dr. Um, Allen. And we have the business in, I'm David Bennett, by the way. I'm, I'm choked up from the last, you know, I'm, I'm excited about what you guys are doing. And not only more questions, but, well, actually, I do have a question. Will you guys be at the event this weekend that, Mr. Terry and Miss Allen is producing this weekend, which is the Women's Expo. And it's about probably 30 vendors of entrepreneurs, Bunchy's Chicken, and also the Thai Box with Darren uh, Washington will be there this weekend. Will you guys be there this weekend? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we have another question here. We have a question. Good evening, my name is Pam Gerald. I go to a lot of these forums, and we hear speeches, we hear keywords, we hear key phrases, and it all sounds good. <coughs> what I don't hear, and I like everybody up there, what I don't hear is solutions and the manner in which to implement that's where we have an issue and a problem at. Now, you know what a buffer is, right? Okay. I want to create a new buffer. Buffer is now going to stand for Blacks Under Fire for Economic Recovery. I like that buffer better than the traditional buffer. You hear collaboration. You hear partnership. Collaboration is not just partnership and getting together. In my opinion, collaboration is where, again, we fail. It's trusting, believing, communicating, participating, and referring. Now, we say support our businesses. How many people in here can say that out of 100% of the goods and services that you buy, that you buy from somebody African American. Now, if you can't raise your hand with anything over 50%, you've missed the mark. We all want to join these prestigious organizations that sound good and impressive. A problem that I see, if it's not money-driven, you don't participate. There are no true volunteers, but I think I'm a volunteer because I do a lot and I don't get paid. If you really want to test someone's commitment level, you test it by what you're willing to do for nothing. And if you're willing to do it for nothing, then you're about the cause. Now, the question that I have is, why are we so socially, this is going to hurt me to say this, why are we so socially and committee extended? Why do we want to be a part of everything and have time to do nothing? If you cannot devote time to be in these positions and a part of these associations that you want to be in, 
step down and let some of these children and some of these real volunteers that have time be a part of it. My other question is, we say we want that kind of up in your face faith. Why do we look down on anybody? Doesn't matter what race you are. Why do we look down on someone that does what I have a reputation for doing in the city of Southfield? Shaking things up and asking those kinds of in your face questions and not giving up until I get an answer. Now, all of what you heard is good. It's informative. It's enlightening. It's inspiring. But how many people up there would put up with somebody like me that's in your face that will ask questions? If you want to see what the process is like, tune in to the Southfield City Council meetings and watch how you're disrespected when you're a Pam Gerald. Up in your face with passion and what you believe in for nothing other than the cause. So that's my question. How do we really get it together and be about solutions and not all talk and implementation? Thank you. Thank you, Pam.
we have a smaller tax base. In a city that is flourishing, or a city that is stable, and I just got through reading some of the cappers for some cities in western Wayne County. You have <coughs> property tax base as your number one or number two revenue source. Absolutely. City of Detroit property taxes dropped to number five. Uh, we're 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 right now uh, depending on casino revenue, and we're depending on a declining revenue sharing pot. And, and I'm not trying to be partisan, but this is important for people to me to understand. Taxes and, and dollars that you send the government are related to programs. So, for example, I have your attention, please. Please be advised the library will close in about 30 minutes. If you need to print out information, check out materials, or get a library card. Do that now. I won't go for 30 minutes. <laughs> but um, you've got under under this new budget package, we used to have, for example, a pocket statutory revenue sharing of about $356 million. And every city couldn't apply for that money. There was a select group of cities that could get that money. Southfield, Detroit, there's a whole formula on that. Under this new budget plan that passed, they cut $100 million out of that pot. City of Detroit alone used to get $156 million out of that pot. They cut it down to $200 million, and now every township in the state of Michigan, every city can apply for dollars out of that pot. Mm -hmm. So my point is, when you get those petitions and they talk to you about wanting to reduce your taxes, you need to think about things from a comprehensive perspective. The other issue on the library, um, and I served as the chairperson of the committee that directed, when Democrats had control, uh, funding to libraries. State of Michigan, just like you see with Medicare, Medicaid, and all that, the state has to put up a particular amount of dollars in order to get a federal match. Under this budget that was passed by and signed by our governor, they didn't even put the three dollars up to get the other seven from the, the federal government in order to have ten. So I think to me all of this boils down to two things. You want the police to come, as I tell my constituents. If you want the firemen to come, if you want it to be safe, if you want your child to have adequate things, if you want libraries, if you want basic amenities, because we're past like wanting the things that we used to dream Oakland County had. We just want to stay above Mississippi in the city of Detroit. And what I mean by that, then you have to think about <coughs> revenue sources and how we can create new ones. And one way we do that is through entrepreneurs and people starting businesses. The other is making sure we have reasonable people in office and that we have people who vote for people that will support our agenda and our plan. We had 64 members in the House last year. We're down to 46. Every single thing we proposed on this last budget cycle, I've been on appropriations for five years, we offered 150 amendments to the Republican budget, which was full of cuts and tax breaks, respectfully, to businesses, a shift in tax a shift in the tax burden. Do you know they didn't accept one amendment? That's unprecedented. That the, the, the party and the minority could offer 150 amendments and not one of them was good enough for the Republican leadership. So this is political. This is very important. All of that links down to that Chase Library I was standing outside of that I used to read books on at when I was seven, eight years old. That place to close. So we need to think about things in those terms. One, voting, education. We need to think about our tax dollars. All of this is linked. I know it's jumping around. Um, I think State Representative uh, Chanel is on point. Uh, it, there comes a point where, uh, let's be straight, folks, uh, there's no time for fluff anymore. Uh, the cavalry is not coming. Uh, the handout's not coming. And we have to realize that if you're expecting to be dependent on a system uh, for the expectation of your livelihood, uh, you may be in a wrong, like uh, Dr. Pearls was saying, you're not in the 21st century. Um, we have to change the way that we think. Uh, we have to become more entrepreneurial. Uh, just like our dear attorney just said, there was a point in time uh, as to where we had no choice but to support each other. The consumer base had no choice but to patronize. And so that my dear brother that actually spoke so passionately, I feel your passion. You know, it's not easy being an entrepreneur. You own a business in, in, in the mainstream part of town in Farmington, which the demographics are changing, but you're successful. That goes to show you that when you provide a quality commodity good or service, 
Uh, there is no limitation to the potential of your liquidity, of your ability to make a profit. That's what we get in business for. But more importantly, God is not going to bless us any more than we did already be blessed. I'll say that bluntly, unashamedly. Why? Because we have it all. Uh, we go everywhere else looking for all the answers that is already right here. If everybody in this room took five dollars and walked over to your business, you made your payroll today. So the equation uh, is quite simple. One, we have to mobilize effectively. We don't get together. Uh, we have to get together, share ideas, share resources, uh, share intellectual capital. Uh, we have to hire those who are the best in their chosen endeavors, which means that education is the key to our liberation, dear brother. I, I do uh, support you in sending uh, the gentleman that you bought the business for to go get an education because that's going to create sustainability for his business. And more importantly, uh, for us to support you, we have to know where you are. And more importantly, knowing where you are, we have to have a commitment. It shows statistically that our $8.9 billion consumer base, we're loyal with past generations. That means if our grandmother shopped at Walmart, more than likely we're going to go to Walmart too. So we are a consumer industry like Dr. Quirles mentioned. We have to move, switch from consumers to being producers and owners. The mindset has to change. Either you own your own or become owned, be owned by someone else. Uh, our mindset has to go in another direction. And more importantly, we have to be the best at it. There's a difference between being an entrepreneur and actually providing a quality business that people would love to patronize regardless of race, creed, or color, class, all of that. So we have to change our mindset. When someone else mentioned Dr. Allen, uh, this is a global community. It is a global community. We operate between seven mile and eight mile on Gratiot. That's our consumer base. That's who we look to for profit. We have to connect the dots effectively. We have to look to Southfield and Pontiac and Oak Park and Benton Harbor and Grand Rapids and Lansing, Kalamazoo and Jackson as your potential market base for entrepreneurs. And how we do that, and this is why the Michigan Black Chamber forms, so that we can provide local communities with local black chambers of commerce so folks can get together and talk what? Economics. Not social business, not civic business, talking dollars. So that we can provide health care because guess what? You can't get health care nowhere. So how can you grow your business if I can't provide a young lady who works for me, who's talented, who's educated, about to have a child, and she don't have no health care? That business is not attractive for her. She's got to go to somewhere and sacrifice herself because she needs the health care. Bottom line. So guess what? Your Chamber of Commerce provides that. We have to join these types of business-minded groups. Now, I don't want to go on a soapbox. I could go all day, but brother, take my card. I'm Ken Harris. I would love to work with you, and I don't want to belabor the discussion, but uh, we also love you too, brother. Keep that economic thought going. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I have a brother, uh, great word, a passionate word. I just want to also say I think it's very important what that we invest in early childhood as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the ways in which we're really going to combat right. the problem of literacy, other things that start at the root. And I think that the child's mind, uh, that person's mind most develops between the ages of uh, zero and three, I believe, mm -hmm. eight percent of their brain mm -hmm. develops. So I feel that's what we really need to do. We need to invest in early childhood education. I think we also need to make sure that we have education reform, but we need to make sure that we reform the education system without performing the teacher's profession. I think right now that teachers are being under attack in the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that we can implement reforms, but at the same time not attack teacher unions and collective bargaining. So uh, I just wanted to say that I also give you my card as well. If I can assist you in any way, please let me know. Thank you. My name is Connie Jackson. I own an all-state insurance agency. Right. And I participated in a program through job link where I had four young women come into my office and work for six months through this program. They were paid by the program. I gave them the knowledge of how to run a business, from how to answer the phone, how to take the payments, how to do a remittance report, all the things that make a business run behind the scenes after you stop selling the food, all the things that happen behind the scenes that's important that most people don't do in their businesses. 
um, I think it would be important that as entrepreneurs, we invite young people into our business That's right. mm -hmm. and allow them to learn the business. I ended up hiring one of those young ladies, got her insurance license, sent her to the Allstate University, so now she can start her own Allstate. All right. So it's important for us to actively involve and engage ourselves with young people so that they learn. Right. And, you know, there's a uh, Detroit literacy program. I worked for a year with a young woman who could not read. And after that year, this, she said, all I want to do is be able to read a book to my nephews and my nieces. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, she was able to fill out an application, read a book, do things for herself she was never able to do before. So I think it's important that we're active you know, you know, you might do a local um, internship in your business. I mean, it's important for us to engage them. That's how we expand, I think, the economic base, that we allow people to see what we do and that we give of ourselves so that people learn what we do every day. Mm -hmm. I, I would just like to say that's the only way that we're going to create and change the mindset. We want to get into that nurturing and it's going to become incumbent upon those who have and have the access when the question came up, how do we get something done? We're going to have to take it in our own hands. We're going to have to grow, we're going to have to nurture, and we're going to have to bring people forth. So let's see that there's another way of making a living as well as understand that there is businesses out there that they can run. And I applaud you for that. I, I, I just want to say, uh, since you work for uh, Connie, right? Since you work for the insurance industry, uh, can we get the rate lower in the city of Detroit? <laughs> 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 I just have to be done. There is a way to get your rate lower.
But we got, we got a question back here. This young lady back here wanted to ask a question, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to ask a question. <laughs> I just want to make a statement. But, you know, we, this is a forum where you do get a chance to express yourself. That's what I was told. And a lot of times uh, in the audience you sit down and you listen to the experts and you never get a chance to say anything. So thank you all for giving us a chance to say something. Okay. Now, this is my husband. We've been married 35 years. We don't get our first thank you. I was 21, he was 22. We've been in the restaurant business over 30 years. 20 of those years, we hid. We let no one know that this is not a black business. We were in Detroit for 20 years. We found out the best way to do business was to de deny ownership. Okay? I don't own it, I just work here. Is this yours? No. Well, when we first started, you know, we were proud and everything, we were young and we were stupid, and we, oh yeah, but then we found out everything was wrong, so we found the best thing to do is to say to somebody else on it. So the way we survived for those 20 years, we said it was a Jewish guy that owned it, okay? And everybody could sleep and be at peace. We don't know who the enemy is, we don't know who the friend is, but in order to survive, that's what we said. Well, me being a Christian, Jesus Christ is the owner, he owns everything, and so I was okay with that. I felt like I wasn't lying. Okay, so only the last 10 years has business been successful. Since we moved to Southfield and then we moved to Farmington. We have been prospered for the past 10 years. 14 hours is hard, it's long, it's, but you know what? The other groups do it, but this is one thing that we absolutely refuse to do as black people. What's so sad is here, 2011, we still trying to figure out what to do because we refuse to work together, we refuse to pull our resources like the Arabs and the Koreans and the everybody. We're still figuring out what do we need to do. Now we done, we educated, we got our degrees, you know, we politicians, you know, we all that, we re religious folks, when we see uh, the, all the churches in the city, what's happening? Standing by, maybe because that 501 people from saying anything, I don't know. But we still try to figure out what to do. You know, so those of you who are here, this ain't for everybody. And we put a program together that we're giving 30% ownership of every restaurant that we open. John Jumbo Burgers, go on the website, Google us, we open at 2,000 times. But I'm still denying ownership, even out there in Ferguson. <laughs> they come in there and say, who the owner, uh, I'm just a cashier, he's a cook. Everybody can sleep at night. White people can sleep. The Jews, the Arabs, the Indians, the, the colors. Everybody can be at peace. So if you come to jobs and you see me, I'm right there on the register. And my girl, this is actually I ain't looking this good. But you just, you know, hey, oh, and you deny everything. You add your own. Nope, uh, uh, he's not here right now. But I'm just saying, I'll give this back to you. So we have a developer program, and we're working with Chris. And all of you that are interested in are serious. And they still talk about what we need to do. You come and meet with us, because we we'll we'll take the time to get out of and let's get something done and stop talking all the time. All right. We got our last question here, because we're gonna have to wrap it up before we all get kicked out and we have to maneuver. So this is gonna be our last question for the evening. Okay. Um, sometimes when I go to Southfield City Council meetings, what the council will say is that Southfield needs more downtown development, and I was just sort of kind of wondering how the panel would respond to that. Do um, you guys feel that Southfield needs some sort of downtown development? If you do, what ideas do you guys bring to sort of kind of encourage that development? First, before we answer the question, I wanted uh, to acknowledge our mayor just came in. Bring the Lord, can you stand up, please? Okay, thank, you. thank you, Mayor, for showing. Okay, thank you. So, my panel, do you want to address that question? Uh, Real quickly. Sure, I think okay. one, of the, one of the successes in most cities is having a downtown. And unfortunately, Southfield doesn't have a downtown. I actually met with our Cornerstone director yesterday because our downtown area is really considered Northland in that whole uh, quadrant of the city. And so they were talking about all the things that they're doing in the Cornerstone area. And I said, you, you haven't talked about the most important thing, and that's the revitalization.
in Northland. It can't take place. We do have to have a quote downtown. Many cities are surviving because they've got a walkable community. And that's what we really don't have here in the city of Soundville. But again, like I said earlier, it's going to take vision, it's going to take creative thinking, it's going to take collaboration with the Urban Land Institute and just thinking outside of the box on how we can develop that downtown walkable community here in the city of Soundville. It doesn't exist, but it can. Okay, uh, someone else in the panel. Okay, well, you know what? I know we kind of went over and it's, our time has ended, but before we uh, get up and walk out, I want to just acknowledge our panelists one more time. Senator Coleman Young, uh, Dr. Nancy Quill, Attorney Nance, Sylvia Jordan, State Representative Chanel Jackson, the incomparable Mr. Ken Harris, and Dr. Zavanya Allen, we really appreciate you coming out. He's just one of many, so we're going to be meeting again. Yeah, I was saying, where you going to tell us what you do? You're awesome. You can know. You can be, uh, you can say, oh.